Hello colleagues, my name is Maxim Sharaev and I'm working at CDAS department of Skoltech on problems closely related to applying artificial intelligence to biomedical tasks with special focus on neuroimaging. And my talk will be devoted to specific problems related to trustworthiness that AI faces in clinics. My talk will be mostly based on our own experience and practical clinical tasks that we have. So, in many areas, AI technologies are already successfully working, but in medicine it's not always the case. There are many difficulties with AI implementation, and one of the problems is how much we can trust AI. But before we consider this problem, let's recall the standard AI tasks in medicine and the general approach to building clinical AI systems. So, uh, what are the main tasks of AI in medicine we will talk about? First, it is a diagnostics and outcome prognosis task. Then a set of detection tasks to find specific disease patterns in data or on the image. And finally, more specific tasks like image segmentation, reconstruction, quality enhancement, information retrieval, and others. During the talk, I'll try to demonstrate several ideas and principles on two examples from our own practice regarding magnetic resonance imaging segmentation and anomaly detection on it, as well as predictive model based on functional magnetic resonance imaging, which is a complex four-dimensional spatiotemporal data. What is an AI system in medicine? Let's focus uh, on data-driven, not rule-based medical decision support systems, which could be approximated with this flow. We have training data, we apply AI methods, uh, get a predictive model and finally help the doctor to make decisions. The example of such a system could be a system of epileptogenic lesions detection in the brain cortex. We give it a structural magnetic resonance image and receive potential areas of interest. So, when can we trust such a system, or in other words, what makes such a system trustworthy? Based on the standard definition of uh, trustworthiness in industry, where the main points are that a system must be reliable, safe and secure, we clarify this concept for medicine. The system must also be accurate, so it should work with a performance equal or close to equal compared to clinicians. The system must be robust. There is a general notion of uh, model robustness. And here we also imply that a model is robust to data noise, to non-relevant subject features, to non-relevant disease features, and to equipment. And the model must be fair. The fairness property ensures that the machine learning model should not favor certain cases over others. Such discrimination mainly arises due to biases in the training data. The model should be as transparent uh, and uh, as interpretable as possible to make clinicians really trust them. Thus, the deep neural networks are often not the best choice here. So how is this trustworthy measured? From industrial practice, there is a notion of technology readiness level or TRL, previously developed by NASA and the Department of Defense. The main parts of a technology life cycle are discovery, development, demonstration and deployment. Similar to this, TRL for medical devices was developed comprising of nine levels depicted here. Starting from the idea and proof of concept or POC, going through demonstration and safety checks, finally to FDA approval and deployment phase. Let me introduce our two examples. One is the project for brain functional areas localization for pre-surgical planning with the Bordenko Center for Neurosurgery. This is an important step before the operation and helps the neurosurgeon to preserve functional brain areas during the operation. These could be, for example, brain areas responsible for movement, speech or vision. We'll not dive into the details of this task during the talk, but uh, we should look at this project from the points of view of TRL and trustworthiness. So here we have POCs working in one center, named Burdenko Center for Neurosurgery, where we can plan operations for different brain diseases. 
Another project is aimed at uh, localization of epileptical foci. These are small brain areas responsible for epileptical seizure onset. The system is based on anomalous detection in static MRI brain images and is also needed prior to the operation. We work on this task with the Pirogov Surgical Center and Kulakov Center for Obstetrics and Gynecology. Again, the POC is now being tested in these two centers for both children and adults groups. Studies are performed on different imaging protocols and on different scanners. Still, for both these projects, we are not uh, completely sure in their safety and we didn't test it in all possible conditions and etc. So we assume both these projects to be at TRL3. It means that we have a prototype uh, that should be extensively tested to reach TRL4, 5 and so on, which is our aim next. So here is a full pipeline of creating data-driven AI technology for medicine. We start from collecting data, then goes uh, data labeling or data annotation. Next, uh, there goes machine learning part with different combinations of feature extraction, selection and model testing. We'll not focus on it uh, during my talk. Then goes the crucial deployment uh, of machine learning or deep learning techniques in a clinical environment on real world data. And finally, there go uh, clinical tests or trials which we'll also skip for now, and focus more on development and deployment phase. What's important here? Data is crucial in all steps, the model creation, validation and deployment. Now let's check possible vulnerabilities with data on different steps of this pipeline. What can go wrong on the first step of data acquisition or data collection? The collected medical data often contains many artifacts that arise due to instrumental and environmental noise. For example, MRI is highly sensitive to motion and even slight movement of the subject's head or breathing can cause undesirable artifacts in data uh, and increase the risk of misdiagnosis. Next, healthcare ecosystems are extremely interdisciplinary and comprise of technical and non-technical personnel, but they are aimed at collecting data for a single subject to make a single study on it. But we aim at collecting a data set or many subject data and thus a problem could be in missing guidelines how to properly do it. In our example, our medical partner sent us a corrupted image of the brain. You can see the stripes on it uh, due to ex ex excessive patient head movement. Image quality was suitable for their clinical usage because they inspected it visually in non-corrupted areas. But for training deep learning model that could be a huge problem. Possible solutions are rather straightforward and include developing protocols and universal formats for data collection and storage. And uh, it is also good to have a data engineer working with a medical center providing a prominent link between data scientists, developers and the clinicians. Next, in medical datasets, the ground truth is often ambiguous and even expert clinicians disagree on well-defined diagnostic tasks. Moreover, for example, uh, to detect epileptogenic foci, we need not only MRI data, but confirmation from electroencephalography data with video monitoring and ideally the treatment outcome. And the latter is often unavailable. Next. Most widely used healthcare datasets are annotated for coarse-grained labels like disease or no disease, whereas real-life utility of machine learning and deep learning is to highlight rare, fine-grained and hidden strata within the clinical environment. Finally, if we consider the detection task, we need detailed labeling on each image, but we have only coarse-grained annotation, whether patient is ill or healthy and some additional information, because uh, when the data were produced, no one thought it might be used for machine learning tasks. This manual annotation afterwards requires a team of professionals and is extremely expensive. And finally, if in medical practice we have a non-valid diagnosis, this affects only one particular subject. But in machine learning pipeline, this affects the whole model assumed to work for other people. Again, here our example. 
we have data annotation problem on the epileptical areas localization project. Our clinical partners have lots of uh, retrospective data and MR images, and they have text reports for them. And we need to create annotated images from single patient reports. The problem is that it's very time consuming and expensive if performed manually. Another example of brain functional areas localization task. We have a weak ground truth. We have preoperative mapping by functional MRI and real ground truth, intraoperative direct cortical stimulation mapping confirmation, as shown here on the picture, which is not always successful for all patients. Only about 60 or 70 percent of all studies have ground truth labels which are suitable for further usage uh, for machine learning models training. So what can be done to overcome these difficulties? First, you need to know the origin of the ground truth and the physics of labeling process. For example, we can adjust or correct ground truth labels provided by neurosurgeons based on the knowledge of so-called brain shift effect which occurs during the operation due to brain tissue movement. So, even ground truth provided by experts might need additional correction. Next, data from multiple modalities should be considered when performing annotation for specific clinical applications, because single modality data might uh, lack precise structured labels. And automatic approaches should be developed to address this issue, and one such technique is active learning, which can be used to annotate and labeled data samples here. And finally, one should acknowledge that the labels might be noisy and consider this in the model. Again, this is our example of epileptogenic foci localization. We developed a system to assist radiologists at manual labeling and now we aim at improving this system to run fully automated labeling which is afterwards checked by a professional radiologist. Previously we considered vulnerabilities in a single data unit. Now let's see what could be wrong with uh, the whole sample. One major limitation of the efficient application of deep learning approaches in healthcare is the unavailability of uh, large-scale datasets, as health data is often small in size. Another problem is uh, that most life-threatening health conditions, which are marked here in red, are naturally rare and diagnosed once in many thousands to millions of patients. Therefore, most machine learning and uh, deep learning algorithms cannot be efficiently trained and optimized for such life-threatening healthcare tasks. Though on average, the algorithm accuracy might be the same as human doctors. But the human doctor will be hypervigilant about the high-risk subtype of the disease, even though it's rare. What's even worse, given the lower number of training examples in the minority subtype, AI system will probably underperform for this subset, since performance on a particular class or subset should increase with more training examples from that particular class. Next, we usually have data from those subjects who have already come with the disease to clinics, and the distribution of samples among classes is thus not uniform. The bias in training data could lead to trained model bias to certain categories of patients. Anyway, creating a large representative unbiased dataset is a hard task. It's very expensive and hardly possible to be created by a single laboratory. That's why international collaborations and databases are so valuable now. But all aforementioned vulnerabilities could be mitigated by adding resources. More money, more hands, and so on. But let's consider that we have uh, different imaging centers and deep learning models trained on images of one domain or imaging center, uh, then deployed on different domain images. In such settings, the performance of the underlying deep learning model decreases significantly. This is an essential fundamental problem which arises both on development and deployment phases. And this is called distribution shift, due to many reasons, such as different equipment, different scanning protocols, personnel, patients, and, it's, and so on. Consider we have four sites of data collection and conventional machine learning techniques. If we create a single model for the whole dataset, it might not be robust to site, 
And if we create a separate model for each site, we will have many models trained on small samples, which leads to decreased accuracy and robustness of the model. Still, there are modern solutions to address distribution shift. For example, transfer learning and domain adaptation techniques, which aims uh, to find or construct a common representation space for many domains. This can be achieved through the use of adversarial machine learning techniques, where feature representations from samples in different domains are encouraged to be indistinguishable. In our studies, we use both approaches, as well as data normalization for sample improvement. Here is our example of domain adaptation on a famous Abide dataset. This M MRI and functional MRI dataset of healthy people and patients with autism consists of four major sites or laboratories which collaborate in collecting the data. Here you see a two-dimensional projection of the data samples from these four sites, where initially all four sites are clearly detectable meaning that there is a huge amount of site-specific information in patients' data, which is bad for model training. And after we apply domain adaptation techniques, uh, they are not dis uh, distinguishable. In summary, uh, in our research and applied tasks here at Skulltech, we encounter these problems with uh, data collection, pre-processing, annotation and samples. And on the right side here are gathered some solutions that we apply to each of these problems. And finally, in my talk, I'd like to mention some practical and administrative considerations regarding AI-based medical decision support systems, or DSS. As I already mentioned, the reliability of created decision support systems is defined by TRL. From the other side, in clinics, there are so-called clinical practice guidelines, or CPGs, and there are clear standards to these CPGs to be trustworthy, which include clear indicators or grades. For example, they indicate when a doctor might use a particular technology in principle for assistance and when he must use it. So it depends on different levels of trust to this technology. Now this practice is starting to be introduced in Russia and it is called clinical recommendations. For implementation, the relationship of these two assessment systems must be found uh, based on evaluation criteria. For this, it is necessary to create a new system, like clinical evaluation system, especially designed for AI-based medical DSS. And finally, this is the example of such evaluation system for software as a medical device according to FDA consisting of clinical evaluation with product performance, clinical and technical validation, as well as checking its uh, life cycle support and systems organizational support in clinics. So what are the key takeaways of today's lecture? The first, uh, AI has high potential in biomedical tasks, but there are still many problems associated with development and implementation. And main problems are with data and not with the AI technology. A number of approaches to these problems are already proposed. And finally, the general requirements for the maturity of the technology and for the final product based on this technology should be reformulated in terms of AI. Thank you for your attention and please contact me by the email.